Here we can start. Yes. Yes. Sorry. By the way, the SpaceX ship took off. Does anybody know if he was able to land? I think it tipped over. Well, landed and tipped over? Yeah. Okay. Mm -hmm. so, SpaceX, the space company. Mm -hmm. All right, well, anyway, we were talking about Higgs fields, and um, we had figured out what the masses were, and um, mixing angle and so forth and so the next topic is um, the covariant derivatives and how they act on um, or how the covariant derivatives act on the uh, quarks and leptons. So far we've considered how the covariant derivatives act just on the Higgs field. Now we want to go to the quarks and leptons. And, um, Let's remember that we identified the charge as T3 plus a quantum number Y times the identity. Um, so I could write that as that, or I could just write it as T3 plus Y. Most people write it without the explicit I, and in fact, I introduced the I explicitly just to make things a little bit clearer in some of the equations, but I think I'm going to drop it in what follows. Now we have, the standard model is really I mean, it's just so obviously incomplete because it's so bloody lopsided. Um, we've got, whoops, <laughs> lopsided. Um, we've got some singlets. These transform as singlets under T3, and so for them, uh, Q, Q sub r is just equal to y sub r, whatever y is on the right-handed fields. And um, so what does that mean? That means that uh, y sub r has to be 2 thirds minus a third minus 1 and 0. Okay. So that's the that, that's uh, how T three and Y act on uh, the right hand field. Of course, T three uh, is just zero on um, right handed fields. Okay, the left handed fields though are. Um, are doublets, and we often write them like this. El is nu e e, by which we mean the electron field, and um, q left, by which we mean u and d. Of course, u and d left. Um, and Remember, there are two kinds of spin one-half fields. The basic fields are two-component fields, and they transform slightly differently under Lorentz transformations. In fact, the Lorentz, they transform the same way under rotations, but under Lorentz transformations, which um, the boost part, the boost part is non-compact, and the two fields, left and right, transform as different non-compact. In fact, one transformation is the inverse of the other. So one is an expanding boost, the other one is a contracting boost. So, um, all right. Anyway, so here we have T3 
is plus or minus a half. And so if we want Q to be T3 plus Y, then what we do is we set Y sub E equal to minus a half. And then what does that give us? That gives us for the top one plus a half plus minus a half, zero minus a half plus minus a half minus one, so these are the correct charges for um, E sub L, neutrino and electron. For these guys, we want two-thirds of minus a third, and so what we do is we try Y sub Q is one-sixth. That's a pretty funny number, one-sixth. Um, okay, but anyway, uh, that these, this choice gives us that Q on EL, which is T3 plus Y on EL, gives us um, 0 minus E. And um, the charge on quark sub L, which is again the same thing on quark sub L, gives us um, 2u over 3 minus d over 3. So that's the those are the charge operators. Now the the real business, of course, comes from the covariant derivatives. And this is the really nice thing about the standard model, that all, apart from the mass terms for the Fermi Huns, which we'll get to presumably in the end of the uh, latter part of this lecture, everything depends upon the requirement of local symmetry. The local symmetry tells us what the interactions R, and we saw that the local symmetry acting on the Higgs field gave us the masses of the gauge bosons. Now, um, what's the uh, covariant derivative on the right-handed uh, fields? Well, on the right-handed fields, we would have, we have T3 is zero, so really it's just the U1 covariant derivative. So it's just like a, a more elaborate form of electrodynamics. So this is I. In fact, I don't know why I wrote I, because this isn't a two by two matrix. This is just acting on singlets. So in fact, that was actually inappropriate. So I'm going to erase that I and just write it as uh, D mu. So this is d mu, and then we've, we've analyzed those, we, we've seen what the covariant derivatives are. It's i g over cosine theta w, z mu minus sine squared theta w times q plus i e a mu q. And there are various ways of rewriting this. And one way is, I'm going to skip a couple of equations here. E mu minus I E tan theta weak Z mu Q plus I E A mu Q. And of course, this thing occurs in in the um, in a form like minus whoops minus e bar right d slash right e right, and so this would mean then that. have a photon come out, or we could have 
a Z come out, and um, the charge would not change. So you would have Q here, Q. I'm having it go, time go off in a sense. Q being the charge. So this thing could emit or absorb a photon or a uh, Z boson. And uh, the, the terms are sorry for the funny looking Q. Started to write it in E and then change. Okay, so that's that's the right-handed one, which is really simple. The left-handed one is um, more complicated and more interesting, and these are the main weak interactions. Now the two by two matrix does make sense, I D U um, plus I G over two actually I I don't know, writing this as a capital E sub R is kind of silly. What we really mean here is The right-handed neutrino doesn't interact at all. And um, what we have then here is the right-handed electron, right-handed quark, uh, right-handed up quark, right-handed down quark. Those are the three cases. I think that makes much more sense than writing it as these capital. There's no point in having these capital letters, it seems to me. So this is E right, U right, D right and uh, E right bar, U right bar. So this is what it looks like. Okay. For left, on the other hand, we do want the, the E and Q notation. And this covariant derivative then is I G over 2 W plus mu T plus plus W minus mu T minus plus I G over cosine and theta V. Z mu, and now something kind of complicated, T3 minus sine squared theta weak Q plus I E A mu Q. So I've, I've rewritten these covariant derivatives so there's no hypercharge, just the charge, and then the, 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 the T matrices, which we know about. The T's are the sigmas over 2. Pauli matrices over two. And I guess it's worthwhile to rewrite this one more time. I D mu plus I G over two. Sorry, this was a square root of two. Uh, and this is, okay, there's no square root of 2 over here. There's a square root of 2 there. And so this, rewriting it again, what we have is I E over square root of 2 sine theta W. And then all of this, W plus mu, T plus plus W minus mu, T minus plus I E. Um, over cosine theta weak z mu t3 over sine theta w minus sine theta w q plus i e a mu q. So all of these have the normal electromagnetic interaction, but um, for the uh, For the weak interactions, we see the coupling constant is E. This is the charge of the positron, or the charge of the proton. And um, we've got 1 over the sine. And now, so that means that the interaction is somewhat enhanced. Well, there's a root 2. 
also. So that, that also, well, that de-enhances it to some extent. Um, and then we have the similar game over here. And um, a T3 and then sine squared theta w and then normal electromagnetic directions. And um, the kinetic terms here then are minus E bar left, D slash left, E left, uh, minus Q bar left, D slash left, Q left, where of course D slash is gamma mu D mu. Now, um, one of the interesting things, and who knows, uh, some of you are young enough that sometime in your lifetime this may show up theoretically or experimentally, but it's that this, there are, as you know, four gamma matrices that we talk about and um, I'm, I'm using Weinberg's notation, so this thing is more plus signs than minus signs. And AB goes from 0 to 3. Well, we have another matrix, which unfortunately is called gamma 5. It should be called gamma 4. So I'm going to call it gamma 4. Gamma 4 is what other people call gamma 5. <laughs> and in Weinberg's notation, gamma 5 can be up or down, and in fact, for that matter, this 4 is a spatial note, spatial gamma matrix. So now we have five gamma matrices, 0, 1, 2, 3, the ordinary ones, and then a fourth spatial dimension, which we call gamma 5. And gamma 5 actually looks like this. And the reason why this is quite interesting and may lead to something in your lifetimes, not mine, probably, is that we have this same relation, AB going from now 0 to 4. And um, there's something else that's interesting about it. In four dimensions, I'm mean, sorry, in five dimensions, four space, one time, there is one fundamental representation of the Lorentz group, and it's a four spinner. Okay, it's just one four spinner. Whereas in four dimensions, one time, and three space, we've got these two different representations of the Lorentz group, two, two by two. In five dimensions, we have one four-dimensional representation. And, um, well, the real reason why we have all these, why the Dirac spinner has four components may be that real space-time is has at least five dimensions, and uh, so that's the uh, that's the basic spinner, and because we're on this sort of sphere, we're stuck on this sphere uh, that's only a four-dimensional space-time, um, we have this cockeyed standard model where the right-handed fields don't interact as much as the left-handed fields, and we've got two different representations of Lawrence group, and it's all kind of, um, kind of screwy. Um, but of course, I mean, I don't know. We don't know. We have to wait and see what happens when the LHC is now running, apparently, but it's running probably at quite low energies, and I'm told it'll be June before we get 13 tip collisions. And, and, okay, well, there are projection operators, piece of L which is one half, one plus gamma five, and P sub right, which is one half, one minus gamma five. 
And if we just look at what gamma 5 is, and we say 1 plus gamma 5, well, duh, this is just 1, 0, 0, 0, and this guy is just 0, 0, 0, 1. So on a two spinner, psi equals, say, left, right, this P left on psi just gives us left zero and P right, well, lowercase right, on psi just gives us zero off. So these are projection operators and uh, of course, like any good projection operator, P sub L squared is a quarter, one plus gamma five squared. So that's a quarter, one, gamma five squared, well that's one by this relation. And then plus two gamma five, well that's just P sub L itself. So P sub L squared is P sub L, P sub R squared is P sub R. All right. Let me just make sure it was one. And we've already seen that these covariant derivatives, we have different covariant derivatives for the left and the right hand fields. And the way that people normally write that, well, of course, what we're talking about here is P left on Q is Q left, P right on Q is, um, well, I'll call it little Q right. Um, to, well, I don't know. I mean, it, the notation is sort of not working because on the right-handed fields we don't write them as doublets, so we should just use small letters. All right. Anyway, what is the kinetic part of the action then? Uh, at least for, for, the, for the fermions. Well, you can write it as minus E bar D slash left one half one plus gamma five. Now this thing projects out then the uh, left-handed fields. So we can just have E. E that means, E means nu, E nu. This is a four component spinner. This is a four component spinner. But this one plus gamma five is acting separately on the new and on the e, so it projects out the new left and e e new <laughs> new e. It projects out new e one plus gamma five times one half projects out new e left and e left. And with the other sign, it projects out the right hand part of that. That's what all of this means. Um, but then what we have is minus e bar d slash right, one half, one minus gamma phi e, minus q bar d slash left, one half, one plus gamma five, Q, and then uh, minus Q bar, D slash right, one half, one minus gamma five, Q. Okay. And of course we can factor out the overall one half if we want. Um, now, I. Let me assign another homework problem. This is a very short problem, so it should be due next Tuesday. And it's just to derive in these notes on masses, which I've updated. I sent an updated version just this afternoon to the class web page. Um, it's just to show, for example, that E bar left 
d slash left e left is actually the same as e bar d slash left one half one plus gamma five e. In other words, when you pull this one plus gamma five through the gammas and the gamma zero and so forth, everything works out. Oh, and let me just remind you what sidebar, what the bar is. Weinberg's notation sidebar is psi dagger i gamma zero, and uh, that's the same as psi dagger beta, and that's the same as psi dagger, and beta is just zero i i zero. So this. Psi bar is your psi dagger with left and right flipped or interchanged in the row vector. So in other words, psi bar is psi right dagger, psi left dagger. Looks like that. Okay. All right, so this is what gives us all the interactions, and of course I did the interactions for the easy case over here where we just have a W and a Z. Over here, though, what we see is, <clears throat> and so let me just mention what can happen. You can have, in particular, let us say, an up quark all along turn into a down quark, and out comes W plus. You can have um, an up quark, an up quark, out comes a Z, and of course, up, up, out comes a photon. So those are basically the three things that can happen, and um, this is all uh, left. But these two guys uh, also happen right in a somewhat different way with different constants. All right, so those are sort of the Feynman diagrams. We'll get back to some implications of that later. I just want to sort of finish my notes on, um, on the mass terms. Now, the, um, the mass term for a Dirac field is minus m psi bar psi, which is minus i m psi dagger gamma zero psi, or uh, minus m psi dagger beta psi. So it's minus m psi dagger right, psi dagger left, psi left, psi right. And so this is um, minus m uh, psi right dagger psi left. Right. So it mixes psi right and psi left. Um, one can also write it in several different ways, but I think I'm going to skip that. I think this is the essential way. Now, notice something about this. Psi left and psi right are really independent fields. They transform differently under Lorentz transformation. And in fact, they transform differently under the uh, SU2 left. In fact, psi left transforms, psi right doesn't. Um, since they're independent fields, we can do a field redefinition of a trivial sort rather than multiplying by plus or minus infinity. We can multiply them just by a phase factor. So we can say, ah, I don't like these fields. I want to deal with psi prime left, e to the i theta, psi left. Psi prime right, e to the i p, psi right. And what happens to this mass term? Well, this mass term is um, uh, minus, if we do that, all right, let's see, which am I doing? If I'm, all right, let's do it this way. Minus M, uh, 
e to the minus psi theta minus phi psi right prime dagger psi left um, minus m e to the i theta minus phi <coughs> psi prime left dagger psi prime right. Okay. So in other words, if we do these field definitions, that's equivalent to changing m to m prime. And the m prime is m e to the i theta minus phi. So in other words, we can always change the phase of the mass in the Dirac mass term any way we want. And um, it doesn't make any difference. That's, so I've sort of shown you now why, it's tr why the statement I made a couple of weeks ago is actually true, that the phase of a Dirac mass term doesn't matter. change it by um, screwing around with the definitions of um, the fields. Is that supposed to be an e to the minus i theta minus phi in the second term, or is it supposed to be positive? Ah, uh, good, good. Marvelous point. Marvelous point that you raised. You get a candy in just a second. Um, no, this is right. And the reason is that, you see, I started out assuming this thing was real and mm -hmm. positive or just at least real, yes. then this thing is an omission. But when I've written it this way, psi prime dagger right, mm -hmm. psi left prime is the Hermitian conjugate of this thing. And so these phases have to be opposite. Okay. Let me get the... Let me get you with your candy. I'm throwing it left-handed. something else about this mass term. Uh, these mass terms aren't invariant under SU2 left cross U1 right. Um, it wouldn't be too hard to make them invariant under U1 if we change the charges, the U1 quantum numbers, the W, the Y quantum numbers. But there's no way in hell we can make this um, SU2 invariant because um, the left transforms and the right doesn't. Okay. However, these things are individually Lorentz invariant. This one and that one. And let me show you why this is true. This is actually very simple. And of course, left out of most books. Psi prime left goes this way, e to the minus is z dot sigma. Z is a triplet of complex numbers. This is what a Lorentz transformation is. Psi L. Psi L then is, in other words, this is e to the minus z dot sigma on psi left one, psi left two. This is a complex field that's another complex. Psi right prime is e to the z star dot sigma psi right. And of course, they're both. So what you do is you erase the minus sign and you complex conjugate the z. Okay. And that means then that the mass terms are invariant. And why is that? Well, psi prime left dagger psi prime right. What would that be? Well, psi prime right is e to the z star dot sigma psi right. 
And this one is psi left dagger. And now we have to dagger this one. If we dagger that one, it's e uh, to the minus z star dot sigma. Remember, sigma's emission, so it doesn't care about daggers. Well, of course, these guys cancel identically to the psi dagger left. And similarly, psi right prime dagger, psi left prime, well, psi left prime, e to the minus z dot sigma, psi left, psi right dagger, and you just uh, write, huh? Oh, so, so this is e to the e to the z uh, dot sigma. And you can see they cancel. Um, what, what's worth noting also is that psi left dagger uh, d mu sigma mu psi left is uh, Lorentz invariant. This is a little bit trickier to show. A uh, detailed proof is um, in uh, the chapter of my book on um, group theory, the Lorentz transformations, and uh, why this um, is invariant. It's, it's a little bit of a, of, a, of a story here because we have to figure out how this guy transforms and so on. And I, I, I just refer you to that place. Um, in fact, maybe I can, I can maybe throw, put those pages onto the, onto the class book page. I don't know if I don't okay. All right, so these terms then, these direct mass terms are um, Lorentz invariant, but unfortunately they're not uh, as invariant under SU2 left. And um, so what do we do? We bring in the Higgs field. The Higgs field can, can make them invariant. And the way we do that is we have something like this. We have Q left bar, that's a doublet, a Higgs field, and then D right. So this is a Just um, this is really just a two spinner, really, because it's a, it's a D is a four a Dirac four spinner, and then we, we 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 project out just the lower two components, and this is a scalar field, and in the vacuum, well, before we get to in the vacuum part, under a under one of these uh, transformations, what does this turn into? <sighs> Under the SU2 part, this turns into, uh, let us say, G. And, um, but on the other hand, this, this thing transforms as G at 9. And since this is SU2, which is unitary, this is the same thing as 2 bar left H D bar. And there's a D bar here. Right? So that, that thing is invariant. And in the vacuum, and, or, or equivalent in the vacuum and in the unitary gauge, QL bar H D R is just V over square root of 2, 0, D left dagger, D right, 0. Maybe I should have done this in more steps. This thing is vacuum bar, okay. Q left bar. All right, let me just, let me just say that that thing is um, up left bar 
comma, down left bar, H, and H in the vacuum is zero, V over root two, and then we have dr, and then vacuum. So what happens here is that this pulls out just the dr part, and then there's a V square root of two, and we just get, I'm sorry, the dl part, and so we get dl bar, and um, anyway, that gives us this. Um, so the actual term that occurs in the, uh, so this is invariant not only under Lorentz transformations, it's Lorentz invariant because it's a, it's a D left dagger, D right, that's Lorentz invariant, and, and H is a scalar, so it doesn't change under Lorentz transformations except for its argument. And um, so what we can do is we can add to the action terms like this, C sub E, oh I see now I've switched from quarks to lepton, sorry about that. Uh, C sub D. Uh, Q bar lepton H D right minus C D star D right bar H dagger Q left. So again, this goes as SU2 left, this goes as SU2 left, and then the adjoint means you get the inverse, and so it's invariant. And um, the mass term then for the decor is CD over square root of 2 V. Um, or if you want something positive, you take the absolute value of that. And um, so this is the unattractive part of the standard model. I mean, e everything has come here from the requirement of symmetry, but on the other hand, the particular number here we pick so as to get this value. So really CD is square root of 2MD. The measured MD over V. Of course, measured MD is a bit of a fairy tale in itself because the D quarks can find and we can't just take it out, put it on a scale and see how much it weighs. Or we can't uh, observe it in a bubble chamber in a magnetic field and see how um, the radius of curvature is. But um, we have estimates of MD and so we have estimates of C. So we can, and, and notice, remember, since this MD can be, have an arbitrary phase, this thing, all we have to, all we have fixed here is the modulus, not the phase. All right, so that's um, for the uh, quarks. Now, for the um, for the electron, we introduce minus C E E L bar H E R minus C E star E R bar H dagger E L. Now, um, once again. The same thing takes place. Maybe I should do it a little uh, more carefully. Here, what is this? This is uh, nu left, e left, let us say bar, zero, v over root two, er. And um, so you see this just picks out the el bar. And so this is el bar, uh, v over root two, Right, and that's the mass term for the um, for the uh, uh, electron, and so mass of the electron is uh, C E V over root two, and again the phase of C E is is arbitrary. So what we do is for each of the quarks or six quarks uh, and each of the um, 
three charged leptons, we put in these mass terms, and um, of course we also have the neutrinos, the neutrinos are another story there, um, but uh, we can put in mass terms for them in a, um, in a similar way, we would have um, well, it, I should say it, it, in a similar way, but first I have to do the up quarks. So far I've just done the down quarks and the down leptons. Um, down being because we're talking about mu d, mu e. So let's do it. So, so far I've done these two, now I need to do these two. Okay, well, the, uh, what we have is SU2 left cross U1. The U1 is, is kind of, um, is quite easy, but the, the SU2 part requires a little bit of um, thought. And so let's, um, when all else fails, let's think. So let's consider the Higgs field under just an SU2 transformation. This is uh, E to the I G sigma A over 2 alpha A on H of X. And of course, this alpha can have an X in front. So that's the general local SU2 left transformation acting on the Higgs field. Now, let's use H star to mean H1 dagger H2 dagger. In other words, H, H is a complex, H is a doublet. And um, it's really it's a positively charged um, neutral. And now we're putting in with the star, we're leaving it as a column vector, but we're using adjoints there. And um, I don't know, there's a sort of lapse of notation here. But anyway. <coughs> Let's see how um, things transform. Sigma 2 H star. Let's subject this to one of these SU2 transformations. Well, this is sigma 2 um, E to the I G sigma A over 2 alpha A H. But now this whole thing goes star. And um, this then is sigma 2. And this starring, remember, we're not um, doing the transposition. We're just doing the complex conjugation here. And um, so what we have here is sigma 2 e to the minus i g sigma A star over to alpha A. The alphas are real. And I'm going to put in sigma 2, sigma 2, H star. Sigma 2 squared is 1, so I haven't done any. Now what happens here with sigma 2, sigma 2, and all of this? Sigma 2 squared is 1. The easiest way to see this is to say, well, we're going to write this as sigma 2, we're going to write that as a power series. So it's a sum minus i g sigma a star over 2 alpha a to the n over n factorial sigma 2. Well, what we can do is we can rewrite that as a sum minus i g sigma 2 sigma star a alpha a sigma 2 over 2 because when you have a product of these two things the sigma 2's cancel and on the other hand what happens to sigma 2 all right, let's work out these special cases. Sigma 2, sigma 1, sigma 2. Well, the, the Pauli matrices anti-commute. 
um, with the other Pauli matrices, and of course commute themselves. So this thing is sigma one minus sigma one sigma two squared, and that's minus sigma one. Similarly, sigma two sigma three sigma two is minus sigma three sigma two squared, which is minus sigma three. On the other hand, sigma two sigma two star sigma two. Well, the sigma two floats through, and we get sigma two star sigma two squared, but sigma two star is minus sigma two. So, sigma two sigma star vector sigma two is minus sigma vector. So this whole thing is a sum Ig sigma over 2 dot alpha to the n over n factorial. And that means that this whole thing is equal to Ig sigma dot alpha over 2 sigma 2 h star. Remember, the other sigma 2 got absorbed. So what does this tell us? This tells us that sigma 2 h star, if h goes under SU2 left, sigma 2 h star also transforms under sigma 2 left. So sigma 2 h star transforms as a uh, in other words, if h prime is g h, then sigma 2 h star prime is g sigma 2 h star. So that means then we can make new mass terms. The mass term for the up four can be c sub u. Q bar left, sigma 2 h star, u sub r plus or minus c u star, u right bar. And now we take the adjoint of that, and this gives us uh, h transpose sigma 2 q left. Right. Okay. Oh, I said left and then right. <laughs> okay, so this is invariant. And um, what does it do in the vacuum? Well, in the vacuum, this gives us something like minus Cu. This thing is um, uh, up left dagger, down left dagger, and this thing is sigma 2 on h star. Well, in the vacuum, the star doesn't matter. We've got a v down here, so we have sigma 2, 0, v over root 2. I'm just doing this one. And um, so, this gives us a minus i, so this is i over root 2, um, and it, it's up there, and so this is u l dagger, and I forgot the u r. u l dagger uh, u sub r v. Well, that's a mass term for the up pole. Is that okay? You want me to rewrite it? Um, I mean, if I do minus C U U left dagger G left dagger there, and that boils down to this. 
in the bank. And so that's a mass term. And so we say, ah, we want CU. The absolute value of CU then should be um, root 2 mass the f4 um, uh, divided by v. All right, the other one is the neutrino, and we can do the same thing with the neutrino. And um, uh, let's see, in my notes, I haven't dealt with the neutrino here, um, so maybe I should think for a moment that, uh, to see if there's some. I mean, the thing may be a Dirac particle, and may not be, maybe my own particles. And I'll leave aside my own masses for the moment. Um, I think we should, I should talk about neutrinos later. But um, what one can do is the same thing we just introduced to C nu. If it's Dirac, square to m uh, nu sub e over v. And, um, All right, so, so that basically is the, is the situation. We've got then the masses of the um, quarks and leptons, and now um, we need to face the fact that there are not one, there's not one family, but actually there are three families of generations, and in fact, In fact, I don't know what the favorite term is, whether it's family or generation. Um, I can't see. Uh, huh? Either both. Both? Yeah. I've seen both, but once when I was saying one, somebody corrected me and said I should have used the other. So I don't know. Um, it's, uh, it's a question more of fashion than anything else. Why? Yeah. So I thought in the standard model they that the that it predicts massless neutrinos. Well, yeah. Um, in well, predict. I don't think that's true. Hmm. It's it's. Let's put it this way. The. I mean it. It depends on what you mean by the standard model. Or as I, I once gave a lecture and I called it the standard model. <laughs> um, um, anyway, uh, you can write down the standard. Remember when we had these, when I was writing these covariant derivatives, let's let's turn around to here and answer your question. I will also get me close to the candy, so I can post to the candy. Um, if you look at the covariant derivative for the right-handed field, well, duh, it's an ordinary derivative, and then it has something as a Q. Well, Q is zero for neutrinos. So the covariant derivative on a right-handed neutrino is just the ordinary derivative. That means a right-handed neutrino has no actual interaction. Also, the masses of the neutrinos well, A, they're very small, and when the standard model was first invented, they were consistent with zero, because people thought that the guy who was measuring a non, not, he wasn't measuring it, but he was getting a less of a flux of neutrinos from the sun by a factor of three, they thought he was being sloppy and he had breathed in too much cleaning fluid. Um, <laughs> And, and uh, so what you could do then is you could say, well, if the neutrino is massless and the right-handed neutrino doesn't interact at all, it's just a free particle in this theory, so why give it an interaction with the Higgs field? We don't need that term. We can leave the right-handed neutrino out of the standard model. Mm -hmm. 
And so in other words, the standard, in other words, in that case, the, it's the way I wrote it down here. The right-handed fields are E right, up right, down right, no new right. But if you put in a new right, in fact, that's what I did over here, then, uh, you know, when you give it hypercharge zero, it only interacts with an ordinary derivative, but you can, um, you can give it a mass, a Dirac mass, by the mechanism I just wrote down. Okay. So it's a question of taste. I don't think there's any physics here. Um, it seems to me there is that there is um, well, I, sh I shouldn't I should think deeply about this rather than just um, alright, let's look at this. Here we've got these two guys are the, the, the fact that this transforms onto SU2 left tells you that the, the electron in the neutrino, or the electron neutrino, this is the flavor electron neutrino, that they're essentially the same thing because they can be related by gate transformation. Um, now what is this? So this, these are the upper two components of a um, of a Dirac spinner. Um, I don't know. Uh, yeah, I, I, I guess it doesn't tell you anything about the right-handed neutrino. Anyway, you can either put it in or not. And did I give you your candy? Yet? No. Good catch. Um, so I put it in, and we get a Dirac mass. You can also put it in and get a Majorana, an add a Majorana mass term. You can get add Majorana terms for all three neutrinos if you want. You can add Dirac terms for all three neutrinos if you want. And it may be that they're all there. It may be that none of them is there. I don't know. Um, all right, let's get back now to this business of three generations of um, quarks and leptons. And uh, what we have then is <coughs> UD, nu E, E, charm, strange, uh, nu, mu, mu, top, bottom, nu, tor, tor. Okay. So when we normally if we, we, we can write them this way when we're talking flavor eigenstates. That is to say, these U and Ds are moved into each other by SU2 left, and the neutrino and the electron left are moved into each other by um, uh, SU2 uh, left. And then, of course, we've also got U right, so it, it, it sort of looks like this. But we should keep in mind that these are actually three vectors because there's a color, there are three colors here. And then we have the right-handed fields. And you know, we have all these guys, right-handed fields, and then the neutrinos, uh, we may or may not have right-handed neutrinos. So, uh, so there we are. Um, so those are the three generations. And the, the weak interactions and these gauge transformations move you like that. Now we've got these mass terms. And the way I've written the mass terms so far, the mass terms would um, give us mass eigenstates that would be the same as the flavor eigenstate, the way I've written things so far. However, uh, that's, you know, not really true. Um, in fact, more generally, what we've got is some ij of 1 to 3 
minus c sub d i j q bar, what is this prime? Prime. Well, all right. I'm 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 writing q prime as being the whole all four fields. So it's sort of a sort of a funny kind of notation, and it, it may be it's a little bit dumb. But anyway, the point is that we have here, we're summing now over all of the i's, all of the j's. In other words, we can have an up quark here, and we can have a bottom quark or, or a strange quark over here. And then minus c d star i j d bar prime r j h dagger q prime left. Okay, um, so those are the mass terms, say, for the for the down quarks. Um, yeah, let's just call them the down quarks. Oh, now I know what prime is. The prime means flavor. So the prime here are flavors. And what does this really give us? This gives us, as the mass terms in the vacuum and so forth, this, this gives us V over root 2, sum ij equals 1 to 3, minus cd ij, d bar prime li, d prime r, j, minus c star dij, d bar prime rj, d prime li. So prime just means flavor. And well, at bar notation is a little silly. Let's just write it as v over root 2, the sum ij minus cd ij, d flavor dagger li, d flavor right prime j um, minus, minus the complex conjugate, which is just the sum d ij. Well, if I haven't made too many typos there, that's the mass term. And you see that this mass term for the bottom quarks, that is a 3 by 3 matrix, MD, and the, the matrix has ij entry, V over root 2, CD, ij. So it's a 3 by 3 complex matrix. On the other hand, any and, well, any n by m matrix has what's called a singular value decomposition. So we can write this MD as some unitary matrix, some matrix that's real, and another unitary matrix. And this guy here is diagonal as far as it goes. Now, we're talking square, so it's purely diagonal. And it has uh, positive values, and they're called the singular values. Well, non-negative values on the diagonal. And those are the masses of course. And these are two different unitary transformations. And uh, so sigma d, then, would be uh, MD, MS, MD, and everything else is zero. And um, what's a little annoying is that nobody seems to refer to this as a singular value decomposition except me. Um, everybody else, I don't know, I don't know what they call it, but singular value decomposition is the right. Name. I remember I was once at a party in Santa Fe in a conference, actually, and um, Cleve Moeller came up to me and I told him I had written a book on math for graduate students in physics. And he put his nose about that far from my nose and said, did you do the single value decomposition? And I said, yes. Um, and 
uh, he was surprised that I did it because physicists don't teach it. They don't. Uh, they've kind of learned about it out of this part of it out of necessity, but most people just um, don't pay any attention. To it. Anyway, this is um, generally true. So let's let's stop here and we'll continue next time. And of course the answer to your real question about neutrino masses and you know, we just don't know. All right, any other questions? No. All right, so let's